are. We are officially in. So this is fantastic. We are at seven o'clock as well. So what I'm going to go ahead and first of all, welcome absolutely everybody to the Bridge Club Pets. Thank you for your support and thank you for coming to join us for the evening. This is a forum by which we're bringing together pet owners with veterinary experts to help answer your questions. I like to uh, simulate us as closely to that moment you actually get to have the veterinarian sitting next to you on an airplane. And this is your one opportunity to ask every single question you possibly can. This conversation is being recorded as well as being broadcast live on Facebook. So thank you for all of our Facebook Live folks. Um, and if you have any questions for those of you who are joining us live on Zoom, you are able to ask your questions in the chat function. And we do have two amazing experts in the chat helping answer. You will notice them by the names and the, the credentials behind them. We have Courtney and we have Shannon. Um, but we're here tonight to talk all about decoding our dog's behavior. And we are so fortunate to have Dr. Amy Pike join us once again. She is truly, um, and no joke about it, my favorite behavioralist on the planet. Not only is she a DVM, but she is a cert board certified behavioralist. And as I always like to point out, she did serve our country, so thank you for your service, Amy. And she also helped train military dogs. She has knowledge that is just like overflowing in her. And just before she came to us, she was being interviewed by CBS. So I just want to say we have a little bit of a celebrity in our midst. Very excited about that. She is not a celebrity because of Bridge Club. It's all because of how smart she is. So just, just for the record as, as we go forward with that. So let's get this party started because there's a lot to talk about. Um, and let's first begin with our toast as we always do. So can everyone raise your glass? And I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Amy and let's get this started. Excellent. Um, I just wanna toast to all of the um, people who are going back to work um, as I did this Monday. I was never been happier to step foot in my office. So cheers to getting back to normalcy, hopefully um, very, very soon. Cheers. Okay, so that actually, should we first start? We're gonna kind of now change the order a little bit. You just brought it up. We're all going back to work. Yeah. So what does that mean for the anxiety that we're dealing with with our pets? Let's go with that first. Yeah, I mean, I, that was actually what we were talking about over on CBS because I think everybody's very worried about um, when we go back to work, are all of our pets gonna break with separation anxiety? And I think it sort of remains to be seen. Um, just like with this uh, pandemic and all the anxiety that we experienced with everything that was new, um, some of us were very resilient and we, you know, we were able to cope and we have never been happier because we're at home and working from home behind a computer and others of us have you know taken up really bad habits or gained the COVID-19. Um, so I think going back to work, it is definitely gonna remain to be seen what exactly um, that looks like for all of our pets. So is there any advice for those folks that are really concerned? I mean, that we could give right now that are worried about that separation anxiety because now we don't have a runway now, now it's happening. Right, exactly. We're dropping off the face of the cliff. Um, I think one of the biggest things is uh, videoing your pet when they're home alone. So you don't know what you don't know when you walk away from the house. Um, and so we've caught cats with horrible separation anxiety before when we were actually screening dogs for the disorder. And the cat actually sat there and yowled the entire day the owner was gone. Um, we've caught dogs doing really unique things such as tearing up um, you know, phone books and my patient today get, uh, gets in the freezer and takes out all the frozen waffles and eats all the frozen waffles when his owners are gone. So um, whether or not we see separation anxiety, we're at least gonna see something entertaining. Oh my goodness, that's I know. so so let's let's um I mean if they are having anxiety, what should we be doing if we are noticing that they are just not in a good place? Yeah, I mean, first and foremost, definitely go see your veterinarian because um a change of behavior is literally the first thing that you will see with the medical issue. So want to make sure that we um, rule out any sort of medical problems that could be contributing or um, exacerbating the, the behavior issue, and then seeking advice from a qualified veterinary behaviorist, certified professional dog trainer like Courtney, um, that can help you with um, behavior issues. 
That's really, I think that's really helpful as we go through this. So, okay, guys, let's dive into, uh, let's talk about my dog rolls over and shows me his belly whenever I go to put his leash on. And uh, really, what does that mean? Should I be rubbing his belly? Yeah, so this can be a very confusing body posture. Um, in fact, one of my clients today had been misinterpreting this for um, several months. And so what this is, is actually the dog is showing you their abdomen. So it's very different than a belly rub, which is like a splayed out, bring it on kind of body posture. Um, the body posture this person is describing is more likely uh, they're lying on their side and the dog opens their back legs to expose their abdomen, which basically means look at this. This is the most vulnerable part of me. I am willing to sh expose this to you, which means that I mean you no harm, but that also means that I want you to back the heck away. And so like my client this morning um, had taken that as an interpretation for uh, please rub my belly and had been snarled at and bitten many times because it was misinterpreted. Oh, Catherine, you're muted. Sorry. Okay. A little Facebook live issue there. Um, so for those of, we're, we're now we're Facebook live. So just everyone get real excited. Um, so for those of uh, pet owners who do experience that, you know not to pet them, but I have seen pet owners try to go then pick up the dog and go, stop being so lazy. Mm -hmm. It's time for us to go for the walk. Is that a good thing or a bad thing to do? No, you absolutely want to try and motivate them in some other way. So um, figure out why they're uncomfortable. Why are they telling you to back off? Is it because they don't want to go on a walk because walks are scary because they encounter all these other dogs or people? Um, maybe they're in pain and they don't want to go for the walk because it's painful. So the other thing that you can do is call them to you. Um, try and direct them with treats using high value uh, rewards and see if they are a willing participant and they say, all right, I'm gonna to come to you because I know you have my leash and we're gonna go outside and I want that to happen versus um, you know, telling you to please stop. So I think, that's, I think that's really good advice. But so you're saying they're on their back, they were telling you something's not right then. What are other ways that dog te dogs tell us you know, something is not right besides the Yelp because you accidentally trip over them, which unfortunately happened in our household today, but I'm just saying so. Oh no. Yeah. So obviously vocalization can be a way that they say, um, Hey, that hurts or something's wrong, but you can see, um, panting, pacing, um, appetite changes. So lack of appetite or all of a sudden, um, increased appetite, really any sort of subtle change can be your pet, uh, crying for help, whether it be from a medical issue or a behavioral issue. Okay, so lots of questions coming in here. I'm already seeing this blow up. What was the one question you wanted to answer immediately? Oh yeah, there? so Dr. Lori was asking about her own dog who licks everything. It licks surfaces and walls and floors and all that kind of stuff. Um, so this is actually called, there's actually a term, term for it, a diagnostic term. It's called excessive licking of surfaces or ELS. And there is um, a lot of research um, that actually a colleague of mine did showing that ELS is actually a sign of underlying um, GI issues. So even oh. without any other GI symptoms, so like no vomiting, no diarrhea, no appetite changes, if the dog licks excessively, oftentimes that's from in, um, underlying inflammatory bowel syndrome that needs to be diagnosed and treated. So another case of what you think might be a behavior issue is actually a medical problem. Holy cow. So right now, a lot of us are seeing, and now we may panic, right? Because this is what we do in uh, the right. fact that it is now allergy season. A lot of people are putting things on the lawns right now. We take our dogs for a walk and mm -hmm. they're incessantly licking. So what do we do for something like that where suddenly they weren't licking before and we're like, oh my gosh. Yeah. Again, any sudden change of behavior, you definitely want to go see your vet. So, because it could be this excessive licking of surfaces with an underlying GI, it could be allergies, which it's, you know, the height of allergy season. And obviously licking can be a big component of allergies. Um, and, you know, make sure that when they come in, um, people are spraying their lawns and stuff with chemicals. So make sure anytime that they come in, you wipe their paws off with um, like a baby wipe or just a wet paper towel, something to get um, the, the residue of whatever they've uh, walked in off. 
So, so real quick question. I know this is where we talk about this is like the fire hydrant hose that you're drinking from because all of a sudden the questions keep changing. But yeah. specifically right now, it's really hard to replicate a dog's behavior when they go in to see you or when they go in to see uh, the regular veterinarian. Mm -hmm. So what should pet owners do in order to capture this behavior so they can really help describe it for their veterinarian? Absolutely. So um, everybody has cell phones nowadays, right? And we can capture some video of the dog or the cat doing a behavior. The biggest thing is try not to put your own interpretation on it. So what you may think is happening may not actually be what is exactly happening, but we also don't want to cloud um, your veterinarian's judgment by assuming that what is what is happening is actually happening. So just try and describe the behavior as um, sort of unemotionally as possible, describe body language, what do the ears look like, the eyes, nose, body carriage, tail carriage, all that kind of stuff. Um, and that'll give you the most information. And I, this is another reason why expertise is so important. And so hence the reason guys that we've got folks in the chat for you. So I see everyone's asking all the questions. I think this is fantastic. We are gonna get to the poop question in, in a minute cause that's a biggie oh, that I wanna know. Yeah, I well, let's just ask it before we go to the other thing is how do you get them to stop eating the poop? Okay, so unfortunately uh, eating a feces is a very normal dog behavior. Um, it's an unwanted from the human perspective but it's a very normal dog behavior because that's how they clean up after themselves or after others who haven't cleaned up for us. Um, and so the biggest thing is just making sure that you clean up after your pet as soon as possible. Um, obviously we can't help it if it's like our neighbors or our, um, you know, apartment mates or whatever, but uh, it is unfortunately a very normal behavior. Disgusting, but normal. Well, my dog loves deer poop. Uh, that oh, is my yeah. favorite in the fall. By gosh, is like candy out in the backyard. <laughs> uh -huh. Goose poop is a favorite of my dog's. It's a, which one? Goose poop. Oh, well, they, oh, okay. Well, there you go. They all have different, you know. So in the poll, one of the things we asked is what is the top behavior concern of pet owners? And interestingly enough, aggression towards dogs came in first and second was separation anxiety. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to kind of cover off on a few of these of what they thought, but let's kind of go through some of these top concerns that people have. Yeah. So I would definitely say that aggression towards other dogs is, is the number one thing that I see. Um, as well, followed probably by aggression towards strangers, um, uh, you know, people coming over to your house or people out on walks. And then I didn't put, I um, definitely see a lot of separation anxiety. And again, um, whether we'll see an uptick in that after uh, COVID. But another thing that we see in our area quite a bit is um, environmental noise phobias. So, um, you know, fear of loud buses, cars, um, sirens, just because we live in the city and, you know, we have experienced a lot of that kind of stuff around here. I mean, that's, well, not, do, the, do phobias then grow over time? Because all of a sudden, you know, yeah the dog hasn't been barking at the doorbell, but now suddenly is. I mean, is that a result of also that anxiety or is there because the doorbell's been ringing more? All kinds of things can play into behavior. So there can be a genetic predisposition um, to behavioral issues. There can be um, learning that happens. I learn what does and doesn't work through trial and error. Um, and then also traumatic events. So a lot like my research um, that I did during my residency was on thunderstorm phobias. And oh. most of the dogs that were in, enrolled in the study actually had some sort of traumatic event at like a 4th of July fireworks that then led to thunderstorm phobias later. And so traumatic events are huge um, for people and pets. So I kind of like that as a separate topic. Uh, give us a thumbs up or uh, if you'd like us to bring Dr. Amy back on that one. I'd love to just talk about thunderstorms because there's plenty of gadgets out there that say that they'll help with it and it'd be great to really get a real perspective on I think would be yeah. fantastic. So I will promise you all here shortly we're actually going to get a few actual tips from uh, Courtney that she's going to be helping us out. But before we do that, um, we talked about dog aggressiveness. So is it possible for a dog to be aggressive because they're on the leash, but if they weren't on the leash, they're not aggressive? How, how does that work? Yeah. Yeah. So in, in our world and in, especially in our dogs, it's fight or flight. And I can't flee if I'm attached to mom by a four or six 
foot leash, right? So oftentimes our dogs are much more reactive and much more offensive when they're on the leash to say, look how big and bad I am, don't try anything because I'm terrified that I can't actually escape if you do. Um, but then we take them to the dog park or take them to a friend's house or doggy daycare. And because they have enough space to be able to escape from any uh -huh. dog that they don't like or that don't like the way that they play, they don't feel the need to use aggression as a behavioral strategy. Okay, that's really interesting because I did take Lily on a walk earlier and she was like basically like trying to go after this dog to like get closer to him. But I swear if we hadn't been, she'd have been like, yeah, I think I'm good over here. I'm good. Yeah, I'm yeah, exactly. I'm gonna hold, really, bite. hold back. <laughs> I tell you what. So I want, okay, so this one says I want another pet. So do I. Um, but my dog is pretty aggressive or mine has separation anxiety. So it's how do, you, how do you do that? How do we introduce a new animal into that? Yeah, I mean, first of all, I think we have to analyze uh, why we're getting this other pet, right? Is it for the human or is it for the other dog? And um, oftentimes if uh, we think we're getting it for the dog, we're not really, because they would rather just be only children. Um, dogs oh. actually are pack animals. So that's a myth. Um, they have, uh, you know, preferred associates is what we call it. So they're kind of like introverts with their inner circle. Um, and so they may have other dogs that they like, but not necessarily, they don't necessarily want to be at the frat house, you know, partying down with all the other dogs. Seriously? Yeah. Because we always hear about, you know, the pack and now it's all about the pack and now you're okay. Now I that is a myth that started a long time ago and hopefully that will um, die. We're trying so hard to get the knowledge out that, that they're not wolves and they're not pack animals, period. Okay, so Mel's with me on that one. He did a big old, what? I, so I think that's a biggie for me. I wasn't aware of that because I've thought about getting another dog for Lily, just but to your point, yep. is it for Lily? Yeah, it's is probably it, for you. It, and that's okay. Really? I mean, if you want another dog, we, you know, you can go about introductions slowly. It definitely has to be a gradual thing. You don't just throw them all together and hope for the best. Um, there's definitely programmed introductions that we can do, whether it be for cats or dogs, in order to make that the most successful. Oh, wow. Okay. And, and so the age of the animal has nothing to do with it. That's not about nope. like having nope. a puppy because then they're helping raise them. It has nothing to do with that. No, not really. It's usually in, in, uh, dependent on the actual personality. Like in my household, I have a 13 year old Scotty. We could bring home every dog known to man and she would accept everyone. Um, but my two younger ones um, who are very playful and love each other, they are not very accepting of other dogs in the house. So, um, you know, it's very personality driven. So I'm kind of still with Mel. I'm kind of, my mouth is still dropped open on that one. I think we really, okay. I know, so, my husband calls me the, uh, the killjoy because I constantly ruin people's like <laughs> illusions. Like, no, they want to have a lot of animals. Okay, so this one, um, I would love to see if people all agree with this. And I mentioned it even a little bit. Um, my dog hates the UPS man, mailman, FedEx, or um, a person so much. Whereas mine knows that who the UPS guy is but doesn't like the others, but loves the UPS guy. Um, is that normal? It's very common. Um, and one of the reasons is, you know, dogs, dogs, we bred dogs to alert bark. That's the whole reason we domesticated them um, is to alert us to intruders. And so the unfortunate part is that UPS, FedEx, the postal service, Every single day they come, your dog barks, and then they leave. So they're being reinforced for this behavior every single day, multiple times a day if you're my house because we oh. order off Amazon like 8,000 times a day. Um, but literally they're reinforcing this, this barking behavior. And so um, it's a very, very common issue. That is crazy. Lily knows because they give her a biscuit. If you guys have been on before, you've heard and if I know we have so many UPS guys that will do that in this area, and then you can always tell the the owners that have those UPS people because they're like, oh my my dog loves the UPS guy because he brings him a biscuit every time. Yeah, that yep. would that would definitely be Lily. So one of the things I I have been noticing is Lily is uh, sitting next to me and pushing on me more, like she's actually physically. What does that mean? It can be a comfort seeking thing. So just like, um, you know, you uh, holding hands with someone or leaning up against them, it brings you comfort. So that definitely can be what's going on there. 
does that have anything to do with also potentially leaving the house more? Is that part of that anxiety that is also percolating a little bit more? Yeah, it definitely could um, be that you are more back to normal. And she's like, wait a minute. <laughs> What happened? I loved it when you worked from home all the time, um, you know, or like uh, we've had a lot of uh, pets come in during COVID because they have increased anxiety because their routines are so, so thrown off um, by their owners being home all the time. So what we think would have been a good thing actually might not have been. So oh, we've all, you know, loved being home with our pets more often. So I'm going to go ahead and unmute Courtney, um, giving her a quick heads up if she was finishing whatever she was uh, writing there, because uh, what we're going to do is get a few uh, little key tips from Courtney as we're going through this in particular, because um, one of the things that this community has shared with us is the importance of getting real tips, things that you can actually apply in your household as well. And so let's, uh, let's get some training tips that people can use at their home with their dogs. Uh, should we start with like leash training? I know it sounds, even if you've got an older dog, let's go through some, some things that pet owners can be doing from a leash training perspective, Courtney. Sure. Am I unmuted? You are unmuted. Okay. So I want to talk about um, leash training and I actually want to talk a little bit about leash reactivity because I'm getting a ton of questions about leash reactivity oh, perfect. in the chat. Um, and the two kind of go hand in hand. So the first thing I want to just tell everyone, whether or not dog is reactive is that we you should always be walking your dog with a treat pouch full of really high value yummy treats we have these awesome ones with our logo on them and a nice strap this is what i use with my dogs um, but you can also just use like an old fanny pack or something like that um, and you want to have really high value items i personally like to use little tiny pieces of hot dog or little tiny pieces of cheese um, because when you're walking your dog outside, there's so many things that they can be distracted by. I mean, other dogs, squirrels, humans. I live in DC, so we have a ton of stuff going on all the time. Um, and so you really want to make sure that, you know, you are interesting to your dog because the outside world is very interesting to your dog. So you want to walk with your high value treats and you just want to make sure that you're rewarding your dog just for checking in with you. So reward your dog anytime they look up at you. Um, reward your dog anytime they're walking on the leash and they're next to you and they're not pulling you. You want to make sure you're rewarding them really for any behavior that you're getting on the leash that you like. That's a really good start um, for leash walking. Now that also particularly applies if your dog is leash reactive, because what you really want to start to do is reward your dog anytime that they see another dog or something that causes them to do that barking and lunging behavior. Now the key if your dog is reactive is that you are letting, you are doing that from a distance where your dog can see that other dog, but isn't reacting. If your dog's already barking, lunging, freaking out, it's too late. So you want to do that redirection and that rewarding when your dog is further away. So that so means- explain, explain that a little bit more. So, okay. So you're walking up, you see the dog has seen it, or you've seen the dog. Yep. And then what exactly should the, should we be doing? Should we and be immediately getting them a treat? Yep. You can immediately give them a treat or get their attention and give them a treat. Either way is fine. Um, but if your dog is starting to do a hard stare or they're starting to growl, or you can tell like, uh Oh, if I stay here, my dog's going to start to really bark and lunge. Then the best thing for you to do is cross the street, turn around, walk away. You always want to do your best to keep your dogs under threshold, meaning keep them from actually reacting. Um, because so when they're, they're doing the, when they're doing the, but I want to go over there. You know how they always do the, it's back there. I want to be back where that is. That's still okay. You're not like hurting them by corralling them. Because, in no, part. because if they, if you're taking them for a walk and they're constantly barking at every dog they see, they're just going to continue to do that. So we want to do our best to keep our dogs under threshold. And it, you know, a way to really help yourself is to try to walk your dogs at times of day that are not super busy. So like early in the morning or, you know, later in the evening. So you don't have to avoid quite as many things. So before you get off the leash one, so I love that JJ just put this in here because this actually is a challenge with a couple dogs in our neighborhood. They're really lazy. They don't want to go for a walk. Like they're like, no, I'm good. I'm good. There's another episode of Star Trek on. I think we're good. <laughs> so what do they do for those dogs who are 
not doing as Amy said before, rolling over on their belly and you know that, but they just are like, yeah, I'm good. Um. Well, you can, again, reward your dog for when they are on the walk so that they find the walk more exciting. Um, or also, you know, there's other ways to engage with your dog and to, to work out your dog's brain other than walking them. Um, mental enrichment is really, really important for dogs. Um, we want to give them things to do. We want to let them use their brains. Training is a great way to do that. Teaching them new tricks, using food puzzles to feed them, feeding them out of a Kong. Meal times are a great way to do that. Grab your dog's kibble and do some training with them rather than just feeding them in a bowl. Um, and that is a really good way to keep your dog occupied, to keep your dog engaged, to get your dog tired out. Um, that doesn't involve walking them. I think that's particularly important as we get into the summer months and a lot of dogs really can't handle the heat and humidity yeah. at least here in DC. Um, so you know, doing those kind of games and things with them is a great way to work them out. So what's one more tip you can give us before we put you back into the chat to help everybody out? Because sure. it's poor, poor, poor Shannon's like. <laughs> <laughs> You're getting a lot of really good questions. Um, my other tip also for leash walking is to use a harness um, for dogs that this is helpful for dogs that are reactive, but really for any dog that dogs that are big pullers. Body harnesses are super helpful. Um, we recommend using body harnesses that clip, that have the leash that clips in the front by the dog's chest, because this oh. helps if a dog pulls, it helps to redirect them back to the owner. So if you oh. use a body harness in conjunction with training, of course, um, it will be really helpful. And for dogs that are really big pullers or maybe are, are larger, more muscular dogs, um, a head harness is also very helpful. So those are the ones that go around the dog's snout, um, gentle leader or a halty. Uh, those are really useful tools um, to kind of just help you so that your dog's not pulling your arm off and then you can actually get some training done on your walks. Um, I, I can put the names of the, rec the things that we usually recommend in the chat as well. So does it matter the size of the dog? So I used to always thought, I used to always think that uh, the big harnesses were for the bigger dogs. Um, so that they didn't get that pressure on their neck, but you're saying, can, uh, is there a size limit on the dog? No, um, the har most harnesses come in all different sizes. So any size dog can use them. Okay, I think that's fantastic. All right, we're gonna put you back in the chat. I'm gonna mute you, here we go. You're, on, you're all muted and put her back into the chat as we're going forward. Okay, so let's talk about um, if an animal has been spay uh, and the fact that all of a sudden they're, or they still are finding objects to uh, go ahead and for lack of a better term, hump. What do yeah. we do there? <laughs> the Humpty Dance, as we call the it. The Humpty the Dance, oh, I like that better. I like yeah. the Humpty Dance. Yes, that's what my, I've taught my kids to call it. Um, so that oftentimes is, it's called a displacement behavior, meaning they are frustrated or anxious by something and they are using that behavior to displace that anxiety. So like if you or I were to twirl our hair or pick, I'm a big cuticle picker when I'm stressed out. Um, so that's all that is. It's not sexual in nature in any way, shape or form. So when you see your animal doing that, what is something that us as pet owners should be doing? Yeah, first try to identify why they're doing it. Is it because, you know, your neighbor has come over and maybe they're not a fan of strangers or um, the other dog is playing too rough with them, whatever the case may be. Try and figure out what the root cause is um, and then try and redirect the dog to something else more appropriate, like giving them um, like a, you know, a bully stick in their crate, um, something else to do, engage them in training, um, really just kind of redirecting and distracting them. So Lily was doing this last week uh, and uh, I just decided to pick it up and throw it. We started playing toss. Was that the right thing to do? Because then I wore That's okay her butt as long out. as it distracted her. Yeah, because then it wore her butt out and she was like, okay, I'm ready for, I'm ready for a little, you know, yeah. nappy. <laughs> so we did mention the thunderstorms. I do want to come back to it because a couple of people were saying, yes, let's talk about it. Uh, you know, we do have fireworks coming up, at least we think. Well, I have no idea what's going to be happening, yeah. but because of the graduations, I know we've got at night now, we've got sounds of fireworks showing up all over the place and I'm sure we're not alone there. What can we be doing in this whole thunderstorm firework era and, and what should we be doing to help our pets? Yeah, so a lot of these pets will pick a place that they feel safe um, to kind of hide. And so a lot of 
uh, dogs may try and go down to the basement or go to an inner um, bathroom where there's like no windows because it's the most enclosed and away from all the noises. So if they have a safe space set that they've already picked, set that safe space up as kind of theirs during that time frame. So you can put a bed in there, um, put some white noise on to drown out the noise of the thunderstorms or the fireworks. Um, there are pheromone products like Adaptal um, that can actually help with uh, thunderstorm and fireworks phobias. So you can plug those in as a diffuser um, or put a collar on the dog, spray a thunder shirt. Um, about 50% of dogs respond favorably to the thunder shirts, but um, it's always worth a um, try. Um, and then the other thing too is if it's beyond that, making sure that you talk to your veterinarian because there are definitely um, new medications on the market such as Cilio and um, a new one coming out called Pexion that can actually, that are FDA approved for dogs with thunderstorm and noise phobias. Um, that can be very, very helpful without having kind of the sedation side effect of um, ACE promazine, which is what we all used to use as veterinarians. So when that happens, are you supposed to give the medication? I mean, obviously through the counsel of your veterinarian, but if you see a storm coming, do you just yeah. like Give yeah, so ideally time. it's best to get it on board sooner rather than later, but the great thing about um, Cilio, it's actually a gel that you put um, inside the cheek pouch, and so it absorbs through the mucous membranes or the gums and the cheek tissue, and within 10 to 15 minutes it can actually hit the bloodstream and be effective, so oh my gosh. that's the great thing about Cilio excuse me, is even if you haven't planned for it or it's a pop-up thunderstorm, um, you can have a nice relaxed dog very quickly with that. So I just want to point out, this is exactly why the Bridge Club exists uh, for the Bridge Club pets is because we want the expertise of someone like Dr. Amy, who can really explain to us what's coming into the market, how this is going to be absorbed for our pets and making sure that we're also, I don't know about you, but I don't like when she gets really drowsy. It scares me when I give her medication yeah. and she becomes very lethargic um, because yeah. I don't know, I can't control kind of, of what's happening. Can yeah. we talk a little bit about pheromones? Because I mean, you hear a lot about it with cats. Is that something for dogs? It is. So the Adaptal product is um, the sort of analogous or similar pheromone um, to what we have uh, have in the feline industry, which is Feel Away uh, Multicat. And basically what it is, is it's a maternal appeasing pheromone. So it's what mother dogs produce when they're nursing their puppies. And it has a very calming relaxation property to it. It's been shown to um, enhance learning as well and is can be very, very helpful for a multitude of issues. Well, that's kind of cool. And, yeah. but are they like, how are they distributed? Like, cause, cause do a lot of technicians I know when they work with cats, they like put pheromones on their scrubs mm -hmm. and that kind of stuff. How do you, how are they dispersed for dogs? Yeah. So they have the spray. Um, my nurse, Jesse calls this our perfume because we'll spray this um, on our clothes in the morning before we see um, our dog patients. And then they also have a diffuser. It looks like a, you know, a scent plug-in from Bath and Body Works or Glade. Um, you, you don't smell it though. It's the, just the pheromone in there. And then it um, comes as a collar. So it looks like an old fashioned flea collar. It warms up with the dog's body heat and then emits the pheromone. It lasts about 30 days. Oh my gosh. I think yeah, that's really, I think that's really incredible. So I think we've all experienced this and I think it'd be really fun for those of you who have more than uh, one dog, uh, if this happens. Um, so when you go to sit down for dinner and then all of a sudden the action takes place and there seems to be this like, let's run through the house and check out every bed. I've yet to capture it on camera um, because I really want to know what is happening. That's what funny. is happening. That doesn't happen in my household, although I, I feed I saw my a dog. bunch of shaking heads and they're all like, yeah, I get that. <laughs> oh, so other people are getting it. All right. So I will say that I actually feed my dogs during our dinner time so that I'm not bothered by them eating or like begging at the table. So they all go in their crates and they have their own dinner at the same time we eat. Um, it could be that they're excited because they know there's anticipation of, you know, maybe some table scraps might be coming their way, um, or they know that it gets you up from the table and gets them attention in that moment too. So there's many reasons why behaviors happen, right? There's reinforcement history for various things, um, learning what does and doesn't work. One of my dogs will actually, um, and this is why we actually started feeding them at the same time we eat dinner. One of my dogs used to go scratch on the door and act like he wanted to go outside. 
And what he really wanted was for me to get up from the table and then he would come in and sneak stuff off my plate. So he had learned that um, what works to get mom up off, you know, up off her tush to uh, get me to go outside is, oh, then I can steal all her food off the table too. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Well, that's kind of crazy. Smart. So we've got a couple where um, a, a dog picks one particular nemesis. And mm -hmm. so it seems to be good with other dogs, but there just seems to be the neighbor dog and it's just their ongoing nemesis and both neighbor and pet owner are trying to figure out how they can actually coexist, but they just, what can they be doing to help where they just, they don't like each other. Yeah, I mean, so treatment for behavior issues is kind of a three part approach. There's management, so avoidance of that person. So let's say you know that they get home at five o'clock and that's when they're gonna walk their dogs. So then don't walk your dog around the same time. Um, maybe take a different route than that person. So you're avoiding um, them. But then just like Courtney talked about with the leash reactivity, making sure that the pet is under a threshold and not reacting and feeding them really high value um, treats when they see that dog, because then it's like, okay, normally I hate Fido, but guess what? Mom shoves hot dogs in my face every time Fido is in my you know, viewing scope oh my God, Fido needs to come over more often because I get lots of really good stuff. So that's really, that sort of the meat and potatoes of counter conditioning. So we're gonna do another counter conditioning really quick and then we're gonna talk about grass uh, and we're not talking pot. Um, <laughs> so, so when your dog, and this is concerning for dogs of an older age, there is that doorbell, there is that, that causes them to immediately jump and leap or cause it and they can hurt themselves mm -hmm. by jumping off the couch too fast or running to it. How do we distract from that so that it's helping to treat them another uh, behavior there? Because that is dangerous because they can actually hurt themselves. Absolutely. So one thing that I recommend is from, you know, for ideally from an early age is actually pairing the doorbell with you go to a certain spot and so you actually go to your bed like my dogs go to the living room which is kind of off from our door and just lay there when the doorbell rings that's their cue um and but if if this is an older dog and and now we're you know obviously we're worried about this issue, I would actually just disable the doorbell. Um, I tell people all the time to put a note on the door that says sleeping baby, do not ring doorbell because no, UPS doesn't care if they, you know, cause the dogs to bark, but they will care if they disturb a sleeping baby and a, you have a mom of a newborn, um, they're gonna be pretty cranky. So that works, Doc, Dr. Robski, my resident, she does that on her door and she's like, you'd be amazed at how many people are like, oh. <laughs> She could see him on her ring camera, like, oh no, I'm not going to ring the bell. Well, and it's true, right? Because, and Kim started laughing on that one. I thought that was kind of funny as, as we're going forward. So, okay, you're taking your dog out. Everything seems to be fine. And then they start gnawing on the grass. They don't do this on a regular basis, but all of a sudden eating grass. What is going on? Yeah, so the, again, I, I hate to harp on this all the time, but any new behavior, definitely wanna seek care from your veterinarian. It could be a GI issue where they're trying to eat grass to make themselves throw up. But a lot of times grass, especially like in the spring um, and like when it's fresh new blades, it just tastes good. Um, and so a lot of dogs, we kind of joke that our dogs are cows because they go out and they just go to town on the grass. And, and honestly, there's probably a lot of water content in there. There's good fibers. Um, and so as long as you're not using any sort of sprays or chemicals on your grass, it's absolutely okay. The other thing is as long as your dog doesn't throw it up afterwards. Um, you can let them just kind of chow on down. It's good for them. So if they do throw up, then we need to get to the veterinarian. Oh, I'm sorry. Did you freeze up or was that me? Did I freeze? Uh oh, am I here? Your voices, but okay, you, you, we lost you there, but that's okay. So you're saying if they do throw up, then they have to, we should go to the veterinarian. Go see the vet. Yep. Okay. So when we did this great conversation on cats, uh, you introduced us to a new pet food that was supposed to help people with allergies, but pre, uh, the same company, I'm just going to go and say it, they're not sponsors yeah. of this, so I'm just throwing it out, is Purina also has a calming care. Is there any value in that dog food? Does it actually help calm our dogs? Yeah, so that's actually a probiotic. Um, can you hear me? 
Yeah, I can hear okay. you. I good. just got a, your internet connection is unstable. Um, so calming care is actually a probiotic. So it's a bacteria. So it's a good bacteria that we are feeding the gut that has been shown to help with anxiety. Um, and it has, has been shown in, in several human studies, many rodent studies, and now a study in dogs um, to really help with um, anxiety issues. And I would say anecdotally, clinically, um, I definitely see effect from it. And I'm a huge proponent of the probiotics. Oh, well, that's fantastic. Okay, guys, we're getting close to the end. This is one of the things that I always want you coming back and wanting more. Um, so what we are going to do is we're going to start to summarize here and uh, look for any final questions. So please put them in there so that we can make sure we're getting. I'm going to quickly throw in a survey because this is your community. We want to bring topics forward that are important to you. So I simply ask, what do you want us talking about next? And so this is your opportunity saying, if we are gonna talk about thunderstorm behavior, if we are gonna be talking more about lease training or clicker training, or we wanna bring uh, Dr. Amy back to talk about any other of the pheromone type things, you name it, let's see what we can do. Also do me a favor and show a little love to both Courtney and Shannon, um, because if they know that we really love them a lot, they might come back again. Um, because I think it makes all the difference in the world that you're actually getting to hear from real professionals who do this on a daily basis. And that is our goal as we are really, really wanting to do that. Um, I see that the, the uh, U.S. McCanns have a question, and I'm going to go another direction with our question as well, and then we'll start to summarize. She says, my dog is uh, kicking a lot after going to the bathroom on walks. That's not where I thought this question was going, but I'm going to ask my other one in a minute. Um, uh, like some of the others mentioned, uh, what is this all about, and how can we work with them on the behavior? Yeah, so that's a, um, a really common behavior. It's a normal behavior. What they're trying to do is spread the scent that they're depositing when they um, poop and pee. So some dogs do it, some dogs don't. It's not a behavior that I would, um, that I would actually try and change because it's not harming anybody. Well, and you just must have an alpha. There must be some, that dog is like, I am. So what I thought, the, I, all I saw, you know how when you see just something small, I saw a bathroom and the new thing about all those people taking those photos on Instagram and their dogs are in the bathroom with them and won't leave them alone. That, is that common? Is that, because it happens to me, Lily is literally waiting outside the door for, I don't let her in. I'm not one of those people, but yeah. I mean, what is up with that? That's really, I think it is really common. They want to know what we're up to, right? And so, and especially dogs with anxiety, um, we call that kind of hyper attachment. It's the dogs that are Velcro to us. You know, you can't get up to get a glass of water without them really following you. Yeah. Now, there are some dogs with hyper attachment that also have separation anxiety. So we definitely want to screen for that. But not every hyper attachment dog has separation anxiety. And well, just we both know I'm flying your butt out here and you're going to be analyzing Lily because uh, clearly uh, she is that person. <laughs> yeah, big time as we're going through it. Okay, guys, I do want to make sure keep all the comments still coming in, but I do want to really thank uh, profusely uh, Shannon and Courtney for uh, manning our chat tonight. You guys, I just want to point out they do this out of the kindness of their heart. We're still a, a beginning company and they are, uh, other than paying them in glasses and other swag, uh, this is how they're coming forth to really show their dedication to the profession. And the same goes for Dr. Amy, who is literally one of my favorite people on the planet and uh, my absolute favorite behavioralist. So with that, that wasn't me sucking up to get you all to come back but I hopefully it worked. Um, but I would love to be able to get our parting toast. So if everyone will raise their glass, turn this over to Dr. Amy, and then we'll stay on just a few more minutes longer for people to be able to get those final questions in. Um, I just want to say cheers to everybody who spent their evening with us, um, trying to learn more about their dogs and trying to be better pet parents. So um, thank you for uh, learning more. Cheers, everybody. If you've never gotten out of um, Zoom before, don't worry, in a moment, I will end it for everybody. But if you know how to end, it's in the lower right-hand corner and you can hit end as you're going forward. But guys, I really do appreciate everyone coming on board. Uh, I love all these questions. They're absolutely fantastic as we're going through it. And I love reading them afterwards. And I, I will send them over to both uh, Courtney and to uh, Shannon and to uh, Amy so you guys can see it all. Because Amy, I don't think you've gotten to see any of this. Mm-mm.
I mean, it's been going absolutely bazonkers, which is fantastic. Really love everybody coming on board as we're looking at it. Um, my dog is separation anxiety to the point when I drive into the parking lot now, he starts barking with anticipation. Aw, mine knows where my vet is because she can smell it. Like when we start to go, she can smell it and she's calm. And then she's like, wait, I know where I'm going. I know exactly where I'm going, yep. which is fantastic. Awesome. I'm just quickly seeing if there's anyone in here. Uh, nipping at a face? Is that so, normal? Uh, no, that's not normal. I mean, it's, it's a normal behavior in terms of, you know, aggression is just a behavioral strategy to say, stay the heck away. Huh? So it's whatever preceded that behavior that's triggering it. Um, so trying to identify what that trigger is for the pet and either avoiding it or making it better for them by um, counter conditioning them. So is panting and drooling during separation anxiety, is that going too far? Is that too far for the dog? Yeah, it's, yeah, any signs of anxiety during a departure are, are too many. So I say if you're seeing panting and drooling, that definitely needs to be addressed um, because that will get worse over time without uh, treatment. So um, question, stupid question, maybe not, because there is no stupid questions, right? So um, how long does a dog remember scent? That's a really good question that I actually don't know, but I think it's probably, it potentially is lifelong. Um, so scents can be, I mean, they have such a higher uh, level magnitude of smell than we do. And think about how smells can trigger certain memories for us. Um, it's very possible that they also have the same association for them too. In fact, there's many patients that Courtney and I have treated that we think it's got to be some sort of smell that's really the trigger. Um, and so, um, you know, we'll either use the smell that we know is that like the actual trigger, let's say cigarette smoke or the smell of a certain person's clothing um, and we'll try and counter condition that or we try and block the smell. I've taken a bandana and rubbed Vicks Vapor Rub on it um, for a dog on walks so that way they don't smell um, foxes or any of like oh. the other dogs that um, are really triggering for them. Oh my gosh. So I am curious. The reason why I ask it is it always finds, I always find it funny. It's like Lily sniffs me like she's never sniffed me before. Mm -hmm. And she's get like so much information by smelling you. Yeah. Where you and I'm like, I, I don't, I have no, I don't wear perfume. Um, so I'm like, what, what is happening is, you know, and she's like, wow, mom, you just smell amazing. Yeah. She's trying to figure <laughs> out what you've been doing the last four hours without her. She must. I mean, I just find it very funny, but I always think it's very interesting to watch their nose. And, uh, we did, uh, so side note, we did discover that if we do open the car window when we are parked and she's in her, we have a car seat for Lily now. I love it. And that I am officially that person. And um, that she calms down because I think the extra smells have caused her to go, oh, distraction moment instead of freaking yeah. out that we're in a parked car. Yeah, fantastic. So little stupid stuff. But okay, folks, I'm gonna let you go because it is a Tuesday evening and not that there's anything on television because we all know there is not. Um, but it is family time. It is time to be with those that you love and scratch the ears of the animals that you love as well. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and end us here. I look forward to seeing you all again at the Bridge Club Pets. We got a lot coming up. So keep, a, keep an eye out on our website. See everybody. Bye.